we could have watched that movie together in the movie theater long before he was very man. He has five kids. <laughs> I told him with a homily because his wife was a basketball coach. I said, I want y'all to have two basketball teams. So they had one. He said, we are not having a second basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> they have two they have a basketball team. But, but Sam and I went to watch this. We laughed because they greet culture near in my mother's and father's culture and love these people so much. Uh, just so much. And the girl, the Greek girl, uh, the sort of main character of the film, very, was dating an American. Just this guy, like Tim Smith or something. You know, like, you know, something Leonidas or, you know, uh, uh, and uh, he, he was a, he was a, he was a vegetarian. His, his aunt, who reminded me, my, my aunt Tony got this or something. She says, oh, no problem. You're not to eat me. I cook for your lamb. <laughs> but I mean, we don't even, like in Lebanon, all, all, in Lebanon, all of the meat dishes, I'm, I mean, I don't know Lebanon. I'm not a Lebanese expert, because we had to ever get back to Lebanon. My grandfather came over in 1884, but two of my cousins have all come, they like, have gone back, and most of us just haven't gone back to Lebanon. It's not been possible, but I know in that part of the world, the meat is lamb. So I just point that out because it's hard for us to uh, um, understand that, okay? All right, so the new Passover. The new Passover. The new Passover. All right. Great. Okay, so first question. What is the first key to unlocking the mystery of the Last Supper. Who can ask that one? Yes. Sir. Okay. It was the Sabbath day of the Passover. Right. It was exactly. It was um, if, if you look at please, will you? Um, the middle the middle, bless you. The middle paragraph of the first page of this chapter forty-eight. The ancient Jewish hope was the first key to unlocking the mystery of the Last Supper. Hope for what? Hope for a new yes. New Exodus and New Passover. So the, it was the, the the key to understanding the New Passover is to understand the Jewish hope, the Jewish hope for a new Exodus and a new Passover. And um, I do recommend. I mean, I don't often recommend movies, but there is a great movie called Shawshank Redemption. I mean, it's, it's one of those films that you now that you have uh, John, you know, these people buy this stuff for me. You get Amazon and all that stuff. And that's actually had it for like five years. It was like, I'm not watching that stuff. Now I'm like, ah, watching this stuff. Works. But in my short term possession, like hope is the most important thing. If you live with hope, then, you know, you just can live through a lot. And so the, the, uh, the key to unlocking the mystery of the Last Supper. The reason this is really helping me is to understand who Jesus was as a Jew, who his audience were as Jews in the next chapter, the new manna, or the manna of the Messiah. I mean, not that we're debunking Protestants, and that's not what we're about, but I mean, it's helping me to understand you can't understand Passover, new Passover, Exodus, new Exodus, manna, new manna, but you understand who Jesus was in this context, what he meant to tell those people, and what those people were expecting to hear, wanting to hear, were waiting to hear, and hoping to hear. See what I'm saying? So the hope for a new Passover and a new Exodus. Now, the next question, turn please to page 49. Why was Passover celebrated by the Jewish people as the foremost of all the, of all the feasts? Why? Simply speaking, they were freed from slavery in Egypt. 500 years of slavery. I, I think I, my father, Dr. Pet, uh, Dr. Pet, uh, Petri, Petri, I, mean, I hope that guy's not going to take me to the insult. He could he couldn't say Zaki, so I hope he gives it. <laughs> he made good. Uh, yes. Pete, uh, Pete, Pete probably told him your name. Yeah, Pete does. Pete. Uh, let me say this. Um, again, I, I tell you, he comes from little, little town, Bayou Woods. I thought he was. Parents passed through that. Just amazing to see that. So the, the answer is 
it was the feast that was foremost because they were free, the people of, from slavery. And of course, um, yeah. I remember being a boy going first to the Lincoln Memorial and reading in this huge uh, blocks of uh, marble, the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, people free from slavery. All right, now it comes to uh, the five steps, Exodus chapter 12. According to the book of Exodus chapter 12, what are the five steps to celebrating Passover? Five steps, five steps for celebrating Passover. So there are five steps, and uh, this was a highly rehearsed meal. It wasn't something that, in fact, they just did really milk. Okay, it was very rehearsed. The first step, of course, is that every, every man, every male, every father of the house would choose an unblemished lamb, year one year old, and sacrifice it on behalf of the family. So every man, every father of the house, every father chose one year old, unblemished lamb. Okay. That won't go. Now listen. The prophets railed against the people later because they were given God short change. They were given old nasty lambs. Old my 10 year old lamb. I can't do nothing with a 10 year old. I'm sorry. I don't need to talk bad about people. <laughs> You know, I mean, it was an old, they didn't want, he didn't want old lambs. He wanted a lamb in the prime of his life. In fact, um, I, before I fail to mention this, it says you took it on the 10th day of Nisan and you kept it until the 14th day of Nisan. Now, I, I gave a homily about this on the, on the feast of the, um, on the feast of Holy Thursday about 12 years ago. And I know you remember. <laughs> but there was a credit card uh, uh, credit card uh, ad and in the credit card ad it had all these it had this beautiful family mom she was the daddy so handsome the children are perfect and flawless and, and they're like in Maine or somewhere up north and they're, they're, they're catching lobsters okay so they catch these beautiful lobsters and the you know, kids are playing, kind of playing lobster. Oh, hey, there's a beautiful lobster, and like name of the lobsters and everything else. And then the dad is about to put them in the boiling cauldron, and the kids go and throw them back in the ocean. <laughs> and of course, the dad laughs. It's so funny. And my dad would have like, I eat my dad a cane. He used a cane. Like, you know? <laughs> because in fact, oh, my dad never laid a hand on us. Honestly, never laid a hand. Only one of us never laid a hand on him. So that was mom's job. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay. Okay. Not that often, but it was certainly deserved. But anyway, the point being about that, the, 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 the lamb was to become precious to the family. The perfect lamb, bleeding, bleating, uh, uh, you know, the perfect lamb. And so this is supposed to be a one-year-old in the prime of his life lamb, unblemished lamb. So that was the first thing that they had to do. What's the next thing you have to do? Set the sacrifice list. Have the sacrifice list. Okay. Obviously, they had the sacrifice left. As he's going to talk about a lot next chapter, uh, the Passover is not just a meal, uh, but it's a sacrificial meal. Uh, it's definitely a sacrificial meal. So uh, the uh, I'm going to skip. Um, uh, by the way, let, let's just look at question four real quick. The law that that Moses told the people was that every father of every house was to procure an unblemished lamb. Correct. One year old, correct? And that father of the house is called to sacrifice that lamb. But at the time of Jesus, it was not the fathers of the house, this is question four, 
It was not the fathers of the house, but it was what tribe? Yes. Yes. Now, why were the Levites chosen? They were, they were priests, true, but what else? They not only did not worship God, they repented. They repented according to Moses. God, Moses, Moses called the people to repentance. And the Levites were the repenters. And so God chose the Levites then as the tribe to then offer the sacrifices, which of course then became uh, the custom according to uh, the tradition at the time of our Savior when he was there. It was not the Father of the House of Roman. It was the Levites, the Levites as priests, as Mary said. Okay, what's the third thing they did? Spread the blood. Spread the blood. Spread the blood. What they use? Hyssop. Hyssop, right. Hyssop, because hyssop is a good spreader. I mean, it's a good, um, yeah, it's a good thing. It spreads well. It spreads well. And it was supposed to go into the wood, seep into the wood, correct? Yes. So that the door itself was marked permanently. <coughs> permanently. So the spreading of the blood by, by uh, the people using hyssop or hyssop was on the woods. And, and so many things that we do as Catholics are just so positively Jewish. Um, as John, as Paul VI said, we're all spiritual sons. We're all Jews, spiritually speaking. Because when we anoint, I mean, we anoint all kinds of people, right? Yes. Um, especially the, these sacraments, which if there's a particular oil as an aside, there's, there's three oils that we use in the sacraments, correct? Mm -hmm. There's the oil of the sick. Of course, that's clear. I mean, the priest anoints those who are sick. Seriously so, but that's not hard to reach. Most of us have been anointed. I have been anointed. I was about to croak with COVID without the anointing. Because they couldn't visit, the priest couldn't visit. It's like, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> My pastor, God rest his soul, Father Adams, um, would, when, when you were in the priest, he would give you an oil stock. The oil stock is the thing you hold the oil in. It's a little silver. But it's not, it doesn't have to be solid. Stone and silver. But it's a little metal vessel. And um, you put cotton in it. And Father Adams would give each priest that as a, before they went to the cathedral as a gift for the ordination. And you know what his point was? Should I die? Would you be the one to anoint me? Yeah. Uh, so we, I, and he, interestingly enough, he went the way I want to go. He had a massive stroke between 8 and 1030 mass on Sunday morning. <laughs> Who said the 1030 mass? I don't know. <laughs> his dog, I know I digress, but we'll get through these in a minute. His dog's name is Lady, and she was so sweet. White lab, really sweet dog. But um, one of the paramedics, Paul Adams, was the chaplain of the fire department, so he knew the paramedics by name. When the, dog, when the paramedics came to uh, revive Father Adams, the dog wouldn't let them near him. So he fled a considerable amount. His brain never recovered. And there are no telling how many priests went and anointed him using that oil stock. So he sure got it. He got, in other words, uh, in another religion, said uh, good karma. <laughs> <laughs> the other oil is called the oil of catechumens. And this is only used in one sacrament the sacrament of baptism. Baptism, we anoint the, person, the, the person's chest. Become, Jesus becomes their shield, their strength, and their protection. But there's another oil that's used in only three sacraments, and that's called chrism, or sacred chrism. Sacred chrism. And this is used in the three sacraments, which make a permanent mark. And the reason I say that is because when we talk about permanent mark, I couldn't tell. What are the three sacraments? Okay, let, let me, let me, uh, I, I have a question for you. Don't, now don't get this wrong, I will call you out in shame. <laughs> what are the three sacraments that are only given one time that make a permanent mark on the soul? Who would like to mention the first guess? They're only given one. Baptism, excellent. Baptism is only given one time, excellent. Makes a permanent mark. Your mark is one of God's children forever. 
confirmation. Is outstanding. Now be careful about the next one. Be careful about the next one. Holy order is outstanding. Holy order, specifically priesthood and the episcopacy. Priests, so that priests can be um, the, the obviously priests are given the permanent mark of the soul to be Christ the priest. Bishops are given um, uh, their head as anointed so they can be bossy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, okay. so, so why did you not emphasize the fact that the priest spread the blood first on the altar? Oh, okay, that was last week, actually. We talked about that last week, if you recall. Uh, in, in Exodus, we talked about that. Now, I don't know exactly what page that was on, but thank you for reminding me, Mary. So Mary's question was, why did we uh, talk about the spreading of the, of the blood on the altar? Remember, the altar represented God? And the blood was sprinkled on people so that God and the people became one. Excellent. That's well worth reminding us because that's exactly another thing that Moses intended to happen. So the Hyssop made a permanent mark so that God's people would be spared. Okay. Now, uh, yes, yes. So Trish's observation of question, and I can certainly be corrected, is, is, it, is it that the Jews actually put their names above the lintels of their doorposts? I've never heard that. Anybody else heard that? Has anybody else heard that to be in the Bible? I've never heard it in the Bible. Now, it might come from, I mean, Mr. Fa Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Petrie certainly speaks about Jewish sources. I don't know where it is in the Bible. But it'd be so cool because it shows the covering of the people's blood, you know, yeah. as, as, as the land. Well, to be honest with you, um, Lentils, or uh, we, my mother had a little crucifix outside every door in the house. I mean, uh, all three doors had a little crucifix above it. She's like, get on back. Say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. By, by Jesus' time, they didn't do that anymore. Oh, they, that's exactly right. I think he points out in this chapter. When they, they started when they started spreading it on the altar, yeah. that was the end of doing Yeah, they don't. Yeah, during Jesus' time, they did not. That's in this chapter. I think. Right, it is. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, because I'm, I'm doing something really crazy. I like reading two chapters after lunch. So the point is, is that by Jesus' time, they were not, spread, they were not spreading uh, this up of uh, blood on the lentils. I've not heard that church, but you know, they say in Italian, it's not true. It's just, it, if it ain't true, at least it's a good story. <laughs> okay. uh, well, let's, let's, before we go to the uh, question three, the fourth question. Uh, necessity of celebrating the Passover. Let's not skip on top of page 55, question 5, which is what was the main goal and ultimate effect of the Passover sacrifice? Who would like to answer that? The main point and the ultimate goal of the sacrifice, as well as its ultimate effect, was deliverance from death. Thank you, Chuchon. So deliverance from death through the blood of the Lamb. And that's why it's so good that we're reading this book. Not that this is new to us, but it certainly tied a lot of things together for me. Is it for you too? Yes. It tied a lot of things together. All right. The fourth thing you had to do was, in the Passover meal, was to do what? Eat the flesh. You had to eat the flesh of the lamb. It had to be roasted. It couldn't be boiled. Eat the flesh. That's right. It had to be roasted. Eat the roasted flesh. Eat the flesh. Eat the roasted flesh. Yeah. Eat the flesh. All of it. Yeah, you had to eat all of it. None of it could not And uh, that was okay. In my house, I would have loved it. <laughs> That's not true. My father ain't loved it. Uh, yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. You're going back yes, to the second. Second thing? Yeah, sacrificing the lamb. Yes. One of the things that um, strikes me is that. The sacrifice of the lamb. Sacrificing yes. the lamb this is number two. is doing it without breaking the bones. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't break the bones. You couldn't break the bones. <coughs> and, and, and tell me why that's important to us. Okay. Oh, no, don't ask me. 
Well, because, of course, <laughs> Jesus' <laughs> bones, thank you. Jesus' bones were not broken. Thank you. I didn't put you on the spot. I'm <laughs> sorry, brother. Thank you. Um, Jesus' bones, I feel those bones were not broken, as the others were, because he had already died. So even that, that, that particular prophecy is fulfilled. So, of course, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you um, reemphasizing that. And thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, eat the flesh. It's arguably the most important for understanding Jesus' actions at the Last Supper. Wait till you get to the next chapter. <laughs> because, I mean, it's all about, it's connecting, the next chapter is connecting the Passover lamb to the man. It's just outstanding. Okay, uh, back, to, uh, back to this question, uh, in question three, fourth step, middle of page, top, top middle of page 56. Um, the Passover sacrifice was not completed by the death of the lamb, but by eating its flesh. Okay? And therefore, the sacrifice was an act of thanksgiving for delivering uh, unto the people from death. It's an act of thanksgiving. You with me, thanksgiving? You thanksgiving. Thank you. I read that. Every day. Every in, in, Latin, in Hebrew, to give thanks. That's why it is, as I've told all of you before, we go to Mass not first to receive, right? We go first to give thanks, right? Because while we might receive many things, and we do obviously, God and Jesus, you receive uh, the written word of God is proclaimed, and you receive a hollow that's expertly prepared, <laughs> and you receive, a, you know, oh, just singing together, responding together, being together, that's, that's great, because you can't do it alone. Then, of course, we receive the Eucharist, the body of Christ. But the first reason we're there is to give thanks. Which puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? So it's really not enough to say, well, like, um, and I've told you before, I mean, there are all sorts of things about our parish that could be better and should be better. But that would be true for everyone and everything in life. So, you know, I told you I celebrate Mass in Spanish every weekend. You know, English is my first language. <laughs> so uh, this is the expression of the normal Hispanic singing mass. <laughs> they don't have an Hispanic phrase. So it's not like they're getting something super duper. I didn't even know their culture. I told a lady I've been starting a catechism for seven children about to get caught up in the sacraments today. And I said, where are you from? The mother. And she said, well, um, so I said, well, I'm like, well, where are you actually from? So I told him, she lives on Canada as well. I said, wait, what country are you from? She's from Mexico, Samoa. I said, you know, I, I don't know Mexico. I just know Mexicans. <laughs> I mean, I don't know their culture. So I know they have a priest who knows their culture. But they come. And I hate to say it's probably the biggest. It didn't used to be the biggest mass of the weekend, too. There used to be a COVID. COVID didn't know much of during mass. A lot of people, younger people, never have come back. Uh, but she, the Fulton Sheen put it best. He said there's a less less practice of the faith in the developed world. I mean, Africa. I mean, Africa? You know what they do with a priest? I told a buddy, Father Carucci went to an ordination in Africa. I don't even know the country. I think it was Uganda. They carried the priest to be. Carried him all the way from the village to the cathedral. They're pretty excited about that, aren't they? And that's fervor. And that's why people are packing the church in Africa. You know? So giving thanks is the first step. It's really interesting. I brought a girl from the church from Brazil. And I, I, I said, if you come to church, what will be the first reason you come to Mass? And she said, oh, I come to give thanks. It becomes a thanksgiving sacrifice. Okay? Now, the fifth reason of this step of celebrating a good Passover is what? 
Passover is called what? Day of Remembrance. Day of Remembrance. Day of, day of Remembrance. Day of Remembrance. Okay. The, now, I do. I'm going way back now. My time is low. When I study, I put my I remember studying uh, the word remembrance, basically the word remembrance, do this in memory of me, in the Hebrew language. And this can come, I don't know if it's again later in this chapter or the next chapter. Remembrance means an active, living, saving, memory. So, active. The people become, they're, they're, they're offering up a Passover makes them in, they're involved with the saving action of God at Passover. Okay? Living. It makes something that happened however many years ago from the time of Moses when the, when the, when the uh, angel of death Pass over the houses where the doors were marked with the blood of the lamb. They pass over. It makes that act of salvation living for the people now. Okay, living. And it makes it saving. Saving. So it wasn't just, and I think it's going to come later in this chapter, I can't remember. It wasn't just that those people were saved. It's that we are saved. So the word zikaron, remembrance, is translated into Greek as anamnesis. And the best way we have of saying it is, do this in memory. So what is the memory? Saving, living, and active. Okay? You see? So it's not just what happened back then, it's what's happening for the people now. Okay? So those are the five steps of uh, a proper Passover meal. Okay, that takes us up. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Now that we come to um, some of the things that uh, he points out relative to what 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 did Jesus do that might have been different from what Moses did, and what did Jesus offer to us that might be something different for us to ponder. Okay, so that brings us to question six. What are the main differences between the first celebration of Passover and the Passover? Oh, let me erase. Let me erase some stuff. Let me erase some stuff here. Doesn't about that. Uh, he does, yeah. But you know what? I'm not going to say anything about that. He was an angel. I think his angel did it. Full machine. Well, he was a teacher. By the way, the machine app, if you've ever, if you might like to get that, I downloaded it a long time ago for free. Now you have to pay for it. The machine app is with that. Okay, thank you for that. The angel did it. Erase it for me. All right, so. The main, uh, the main differences. What was the first main difference? Passover. Uh, exactly, the location. The location was the main difference. The location. The location of the Passover meal. The location of the Passover meal is different. So, in the first Passover, it happened in every single what? Oh. Home. It happened in every single home. Then, the sacrifice became the locus of the place of the Passover sacrifice became the temple in Jerusalem. Okay? So that's the first difference between what our Lord would have done. It was every home has now been moved to just the temple in Jerusalem. Temple in Jerusalem. 
Okay, I think the second one. Who would like to put on the second one? Yeah, the way the way they were sacrificed. Okay. That's the next one. Too. Yes. Yeah, the way they were sacrificed. Uh, in fact, the way that they were sacrificed. Uh, before we go, yeah, uh, the original sacrifice. Before we go too far, every father. About top of page sixty-one. Yeah, sixty. Pardon me, sixty. Every father celebrated the Passover by taking a lamb and procuring it. Then it became the Levites. Uh, the Passover was not just a meal, but a sacrifice. The second uh, way that's different is, is what? How were the lambs killed? They were crucified. Interesting. Yeah. See, let me ask you a question. And I'm not going to ask for show of hands because if you don't show your hands, you're going to be like, they're dumb people. <laughs> I never knew this. I'm raising my hand. I never knew the mode of of sacrificing the lamb had come to a crucifixion so that at the time our dear Lord's sacrifice of the cross that would have been normal for the people of Israel to see those lambs sacrificed in that manner. So not just the location but the way was in and of itself a form of crucifixion. Which I thought was pretty late like crucifixion. That is I, I've spelled crucifixion before. Dr. Petrie. Sir. Dr. Petrie, in one of his talks. What's that? In one of Dr. Petrie's talks. Yes. He talks about imagine Jesus, 12 years old, going to Jerusalem and seeing all those lambs being taken from the temple to the homes on crosses. Wow. Knowing what's going to happen to him. So to John's point was, imagine Jesus going into the temple as a 12 year old kid and seeing all those lambs being held as, as, as in the form of a cross taking each individual home and knowing that that was his way to save us from sin. Excellent. Thank you, John. Okay. So the, the, the lamb itself was crucified. Okay. And it, it, oh, by the way, um, he points out something very well. <clears throat> the sacrificial aspect, I'll talk about 62. The sacrificial aspect of the time of Jesus is important to stress because a modern people's concept of Passover is often shaped by our knowledge of the contemporary Jewish Passover meal, often called the Seder. And I mean, that was like, I'm all due respect, to the 1970s. I mean, everybody's doing the Seder meal, right? Well, they just become a meal then, right? Well, Passover is not just a meal. It's a sacrifice. So, so the, the Seder should be um, put into context even, even uh, it doesn't certainly fulfill uh, the entirety of what our dear Lord meant. Now, the, part, the, the third reason that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, number six, the main difference, pardon me, to, uh, Bible page 64, uh, the third important difference between the original Passover and the later Jewish tradition is, is that the ancient rabbis saw each annual celebration of the Passover as a way of participating in the first exodus. The Passover meal is not just a sacrifice, and this is what I talked about earlier, right? But it's a memorial and remembrance. Somehow it makes present the deliverance that has been won for the ancestors of Egypt from, from slavery in Egypt to the present. Okay. And by the way, not to move too far ahead, but isn't this our understanding of, I don't want to go too far ahead, the Catholic Mass? It makes what Jesus did on the cross present for us in an unbloody way for our salvation now. So he saved us, but he's presently saving us, right? Now, 25 minutes, and I think we can get through this question pretty quickly. Yes, Joe. Sure. There's was one difference I saw in here that wasn't identified as a difference. Mm -hmm. I wondered why they just skipped over it. What's that, Joe? Where is it? The original, they roasted the lamb. When, when they moved into the, the further on, everybody was involved. 
Yeah. Well, I don't know. That is a significant difference. John, I don't know why he didn't identify the reason that. What's it, what's, what, they, I, 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 I don't know the reason Moses said boil the lamb. But he said Moses was the lamb. Okay, the question was just pointing. What happened that they couldn't, they didn't have to roast it, but they could boil it? Right, they could. Uh, that, you know, that's and a great question. Not even identified There's some questions I can't answer. Right. I'm, not, I'm not educated. Okay. But I appreciate the question because it, it's fodder for us to do some research on our own. That's why we study together, because it helps us too. Uh, maybe point out a question and do our own little research. Thank you, Joe. It's great for you. Um, but I was going to give you the notion of sacrifice and salvation for the Mass. And I, I've told you this so many times. But my favorite meal was red, white beans and rice. Remember what she had to do? She started the night before. She soaked the beans. Right? And soaked the beans because they're hard beans. And in the morning, she puts up with beans, all kinds of stuff. Red, red, I saw peppers and all that stuff. Love it. And then, then when I came home from school, she was, she was frying out the sausage with a pan of rice beans. Awesome. Then we sat there and simmered for about two or three hours. Then Daddy had to come home. We eat about seven hours. <coughs> See, it, it's not enough to cook the beans. The beans have to be served. It's not enough to cook the lamb. It's not enough for him even to die on the cross. We have to partake. We have to eat. It, that, that becomes a living memory for us. So it's, it's that those beans I mentioned, this is a, a key example, that the beans were simmering, but they had to be served. The mass is serving up salvation that he cooked on the cross for us. Okay. So that's, that's a little bit of a reflection. I've given that example a lot of times. But does anybody remember that example? Good. I'm glad I'm to prove it to you. Listen, I it. <laughs> but I think that's great. Okay. Uh, the, se the, se the seventh question is very simple. According to the historian Josephus, how many lambs? And this was found back on page, um, page 61. Yeah. So it's, it's likely that, I mean, his, his accounting. Is, uh, he was a priest, I think. Uh, it said 256,500 lambs for 2.7 million people. Yeah. It's a lot of lambs. A lot of blood. Don't you think that's why they started boiling? Oh, maybe so. Instead of roasting? Who knows? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a big old cook out there. Yeah, so the point is, is that. I've often thought about that number. I've heard a similar number before from some other source. Well, maybe it's the same source, but another book. And I thought, imagine that one year, a quarter of a million lambs are slaughtered. And truly, not one sin was forgiven by one year's worth of lambs. Not one sin. And the sacrifice of the lamb forgives all sins. I mean, that's just a great thought, isn't it? The lamb of sacrifice. Jesus becomes the lamb of sacrifice. All right. A wide sacrifice, a wide blood sacrifice is commanded by Moses and see. Okay. The temple was destroyed. Okay. The temple was in fact destroyed, so blood sacrifices ceased altogether. I mean, they didn't have a place to offer the sacrifice, so the sacrifice in and of itself uh, was was ceased because the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Yeah, and then the temple was altogether destroyed. I think uh, what which which uh, which captivity Babylonians uh, destroyed the first grand temple, and then they built it back. King Herod built it back. There's a wall. wall. Cyrus brought it back to to build it again. And then there's one wall left on the western wall. But uh, the, the Romans finally destroyed the temples. I talked to you last week. In fact, if you really want to see something very interesting, not, not that I'm not trying to impress you with my child at all, I just happened to live in Rome. The, uh, Titus the Emperor, Titus the Emperor destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. And the, um, after every victory, 
when the, when the armies of Rome were victorious, they built this, what was called a triumphal arch. You've heard of Arc Triumph of Paris, right? Well, the, arc, the, the triumphal arches were in the center of the city and the Roman Forum, which was the center, the Roman Forum was the center of politics and religion, the Roman Forum. They built the triumphal arches there so that when the armies would come back, they would march through the arch. Okay, did you know that? I'm glad they didn't let you in. <laughs> but then the arch itself would have designs of things that they destroyed or spoils of the war. Okay. So the arch of Titus, that commemorated the, the destruction of the temple, had all the Jewish symbols, the menorah and other Jewish things, because they destroyed Jerusalem. Yes. You've been to where this occurred, I think you told us. To the Holy Land? Right. No, yes. I mean where this Passover occurred. Well, you know, I did go to Jerusalem. I sure did. Now, I, that was the only worthwhile trip I've ever taken. Because it really... Now, of course, the more impressive parts of the Holy Land are what you see outdoors. Not the church that's built over the nativity. Back of the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Because, but when you can see the outdoors. But I will say this I was in Jerusalem over Holy Week. I was taken by a Jesuit priest, a group of us in there, he's on Mikowski. And he was a great, my gosh, what a tour guide. Typical Jesuit. He like spoke a hundred languages. I mean, if he got caught in the desert, he would be speaking those people in the language. He was an archaeologist. And he was just a very happy person. So he's a great tour guide. And uh, we were there to the Holy Land, probably here in Holy Week. So Tim, you got to really sense how crowded it would have been with Jesus himself celebrating the Passover. And of course, if you lived within so many miles of Jerusalem, you were obligated to go celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. So, Oh, that's what I wanted to yes, say. Yes. It's hard for me to envision standing out there in the event where there were a million people. And a million people, there was so much uh, technology to get those million people organized. How in the world yes, at that question. time could you have 2.7 million people with that many around? It's a, it's a Tim's question is how do they organize themselves? I mean, Tim, Sandy did an organization. I think they were as a million people. I was I was in a football game in January. Took me took me by the FBI two and a half hours to get out of the parking lot. <laughs> I could have walked to the hotel. But uh, I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I think there was a, a lot of level of togetherness. I mean, uh, people just stacked in, you know, just stacked in this lived real tight. I think there was a, a sense of people getting individual beds. Uh, so I think there was just a lot of togetherness. So 2.7 million people, there's a lot of togetherness. Um, yeah, yes, Ms. Healy. Mexican tacos in. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, we've gone from theology of beans and rice to theology of tacos. Like That's good. That's good. That's excellent. Okay. The point being, um, I think so Julie's point is a good point. That is, they, they had to be ready. To, you had to be ready to flee, right? So they couldn't have like, they couldn't have leather bread. And, and of course, they were ready. I've eaten my share of tacos. Boy, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. But your point is well taken. Thank you, Mister.
But he did go to Jerusalem. So as a devout Jew, he did go to Jerusalem, which is exactly where the Passover took place. But he wasn't I mean, at the temple. Where the last supper. Well, they, were, they didn't have to go to the temple because they didn't need to be at the temple, per se. They had to take the, the lambs that were, were sacrificed by the temple priests and partake of that. And bring it back to where they Where they stayed, sure. But they didn't have land. Oh, sure they had land. Oh, they had land? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not Greeks, but they had land. <laughs> no, just these guys. Yeah, they didn't have yeah, no, no, they had land. Every one of them had land. They did have land. You had to have land. Okay. You had to have land, for sure, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, John. Yeah, Father, there, was, there would be like 20 people in the group, and one would go to the temple. Okay. And that, but as far as the, the other gentleman's question about the boiling, yes. in Deuteronomy, it's when when they started having to go to the temple rather than doing it at their homes. Moses said, you may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place which the Lord your God will choose, which was Jerusalem, to make his name dwell in it. There you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall boil it and eat it at the place which the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Got your answer, Joe. So that's when it happened. Was when they essentially wasn't the difference between the old and the well, I mean, it's, 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 time. Yeah. Because I don't get the well, because, of course, it didn't happen in each individual house. And somebody mentioned a lot of blood. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it becomes a pragmatic message like uh, Tim said, when you do the 256,000 lambs and 2.7 million people. <laughs> very, very good. Very good. Anything else before we go on? You all make an excellent points. These are good points. Okay. Um, when did Jesus think the new Passover would take place? After last Passover. He, he knew that it would take place. That, that, uh, when did he think the new Passover would take place? After last Supper. Where did I have that? Uh, that's it. When did Jesus think, the oh, middle of page 68, when did Jesus think the Passover would take place? Only possible answer is the Last Supper, when Jesus celebrated the final Passover of his life, immediately before his own exodus, which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem, as John pointed out, the place uh, of, uh, of uh, sacrifice. What are the similarities that would have happened in the days of the Passover and the Last Supper? What is, the, what is the similarity? The Passover is the Last Supper. The Passover. The Last Supper is the celebration of Passover. So that's the first similarity. It's the Last the last Supper is the Passover. We don't have to go looking for what it is. And we put up, we put up all the reasons, five steps of a good Passover, right? So the, the Last, the, the Passover is the Last Supper. Now, who is the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus. That's, that's clear. What were the differences between the Passover meal and the Last Supper? What was the, what was the first one that points out? Okay, so think about this. Generally speaking, who do you eat Thanksgiving with? Yeah. Right. Who do you eat Christmas with? Yeah. Generally speaking, who do you eat Easter with? Yeah. Right. Your family. When I was a boy, I was a boy. 21 years old, uh, we got a day off for Thanksgiving in the seminary. Uh, we got Friday, I think, off or something like that. We had to be back on Saturday. I, I, anyway, I mean, it was a real short break. It was one of some cubbies. And I, I mentioned this to you in another place. Uh, but uh, the biggest band in 1988, when I was a junior in college seminary, senior in college seminary, 89, 80, 88, Thanksgiving year 88. The biggest fan was U2. Okay. So my cousin, who was like my brother, called me and said, I can't, I'm not, you're not going to believe this. I got two tickets to U2. <coughs> it's New Orleans. Like Friday after Thanksgiving or something. I said, awesome. This is going to be the best thing ever. So uh, he was a, he was a freshman in law school at the time. So I called my mother. I said, Mom, I have great news. I have a ticket to you, too. She said, well, that's wonderful. I know you love that band. Who is it? And so it's Friday after Thanksgiving, which means I won't be able to come home for Thanksgiving. She said, well, you have to go to the concert. <laughs> now, I'll tell you something. 
That's a lot different between my brothers and sisters' children and us. You, you were home with your family for every holiday. You were with your family for every single holiday. We don't tell them, we'll go to the beach. The heck you are. Go to the beach. I don't go to the beach the other day. You ain't going to the beach on Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter. So who do they celebrate Passover with? They're Jesus, the Son of Man, has no place to live. He has no family. Who is his family? Where is family? Your mother and your brother and your sisters are waiting outside. He said, who are my brothers and my brothers and my sisters? The one who does the will of the Father is brother and sister and mother to me. So that's why our dear Lord didn't celebrate the Passover with his family. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't choose to do so. Okay. Uh, now, what other difference would there have been? There was, who was, well, to answer the question before, um, who is the Lamb? Jesus. How do we know he's the Lamb? Deviation from the script. <laughs> Trish. This is my Father. Which will be given what? Uh, for you. Think about that now. He was telling him he was going to die. Exactly. This is my body. He's the lamb. Which will be given up. What's up? Yeah. On the cross. Yeah. For you. Oh. Okay. So he's given up for you. He's the sacrifice. Oh. So he's the lamb of sacrifice. Why did then Jesus command his disciples to eat his body? This is the last question, question 12. Because he is what? He is the? What the author points out, the first thing is because he is the Messiah. Jesus not only saw himself as the long and way Messiah, he was the Messiah. But why did he tell me the lamb? Because he was the Passover lamb. He was the new Passover lamb. Now let me tell you something. This is leading, it's a segment, a fabulous segment, to all those who would argue that we who believe that we eat the body and blood of our Savior are cannibals. This is a perfect segue to the next chapter, which is the man of the Messiah. Because he believes that he is the Messiah, but he also believes he's ushering in a new exodus by a new Passover. Who was sacrificed in the first Passover? Lambs. Who is he? The lamb. Okay. So any questions or comments? Yes, Julie. Um, I was reading in an earlier page about how um, the Hyssop and blood would reappear in, in Jesus' Passover. Um, is it right that the Hyssop was used? Yeah. To lift up the spine? Right, there so the hyssop comes back when our blessed Lord is giving hyssop to drink the wine. So hyssop is, is prefigured and, and then fulfilled in the death of our Savior. Excellent. The, the lamb being sacrificed, the blood is placed in the lips. Excellent. Yes, yes. Uh, is, is it any question that it would make any sense when discussed today? But Several times in the Bible, or uh, we hear of the children being killed. Why would God have allowed such a thing? And in today, abortion is so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what was was child sacrifice permitted by God? Um, The sacrifice that makes the covenant, the first covenant real, is the, is the sacrifice of the lamb. Um, there is an allusion to child sacrifice on the part of um, Abraham and Isaac. But while God said, take your son up the mountain, 
he did not require the sacrifice. So he did not require that. But that was the fruit of his faith. So I don't know that there's a place in the Old Testament where God requires child sacrifice. I can't recall that. Well, well, the angel stayed the hand of, of, of Abraham. Yeah, so he didn't have to. Now, back to move forward, God the Father does not stay his hand with the sacrifice of his only son. So Isaac becomes the prefigure of Jesus whose father, Abraham, did not have to sacrifice his son. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son that anyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. Joe. That's, that's one of the interesting things about that. You know, Isaac carried the wood for the fire up the mountain himself, just like Jesus carried his cross. Oh, wow. That's a great point. So John's point was that Isaac had to carry the wood up there for the whole cost that he could have been, and Jesus carries his wood up. But Jesus does not... Uh, Jesus is actually going to die for us. Yeah. I'll stand here. One other point to that. Yes. He must have given the same thought. Yes. Because um, the other thing was, um, Isaac looked at his dad and said, well, where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? And his father said, God will provide. Right. God will provide. Same thing with you. Right. God will provide. And so Patricia's point is, you know, uh, Isaac, where, where's the animal that will be sacrificed? And, and, and Abraham said, God will provide the sacrifice. In fact, you're talking about child sacrifice. Uh, and, uh, the, the Aztec culture was the predominant culture in Mexico at the time of our Blessed Mother's appearing to uh, Juan Diego. And there were many thousands of children sacrificed to the Aztec gods at the time of our Blessed Mother's appearance. When evangelization occurred because of her apparition, within a matter of a few years, child sacrifice ceased. So the culture was formed by the church, but the church is paid. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Michelle. I had a question that after reading this. When did we become Catholics and not stay Jews? Well, as, as I told you three weeks ago, two weeks ago, the fellows just didn't want to be circumcised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so what happened was, and this is all found in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, was that um, there were some people, and it would appear as though Peter was among them, who believed that you had to enter into Christianity, the Christian faith, that then become a Jew first. You had to enter into circumcision. You had to uh, follow the dietary laws. And Peter had a dream and said, Paul and Peter were going at it. In Jerusalem, they're about to go at it. Peter had a dream and some vision, and it was that basically all food is clean. So the disciples of Jesus considered themselves to follow a new Lord. It was a new faith. It was the fulfillment of the Jewish faith, clearly, but it was a new way. And that's what I think St. Paul calls it a new way. So you don't have to follow that stuff. That's not to say that God didn't want his people. To follow him. He did. But we don't have to be circumcised. Now, generally speaking, young boys are circumcised in our culture for cleanliness sake. But we, we can eat the lobster and the crabs and the shrimp and the pork. Because God, they, they had a big argument about it. So don't eat the meat of strangled animals. Obey marriage law, which we don't very close to them, basically. And uh, there was one other thing. Uh, there's three things. No, no blood. Don't, don't eat the meat of strangled animals. No blood. Oh, don't drink blood. Don't, don't drink you blood. Couldn't, you couldn't even eat meat with blood in it. Blood. You couldn't even eat breast milk. No blood. And uh, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's the Apostles is where it becomes clear, Charlotte, that we as Christians are following a new way, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but he is the New Testament. Well, I, I understand that we become Christians after Jesus died. But when did the term? The Acts of the Apostles. Read the Acts of the Apostles. And you will find in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter and Paul are about to go at it. And Peter had a dream that Paul was right. Paul said, Are you crazy? We're, we're, we're followers of Jesus Christ. We don't have to be circumcised. You can eat what you want. And Peter was, 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 being, was being talked to by something. Man, 
you know, we're Jews. You got to do this stuff, man. You got to do all that Jewish stuff. And but he got this awesome dream that said, no, you don't. Read the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah, it's, it's great. What else? Yes. Back to the right. new pastor. Yes. Um, can you imagine what it would be like? They're sitting there, and this is all in retrospect now, yeah. but they understand all of this. But at that moment, when this is happening, they don't totally get it. No. It's funny she said that. Brenda's point was when Jesus' apostles were in the Last Supper, they didn't get it. Do you understand that we understand it more than they did? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, why didn't they get it? Because he said it to him. Why didn't they get it? Yeah, um, because it could hurt. Yeah, they didn't well, get it. Seven times. They, they didn't, didn't get it. They didn't get a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were, I, I say, you know, they were still in the, uh, they were walking out of the uh, ascension. He said, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? <laughs> you know what I just did? I died for you. I rose from the dead for you. I walked with you for 40 days. So it, it took them a lot of time for it to settle. It's like a good cup of coffee or a good bottle of wine. It takes some time for things like the Turkish coffee or the Guinness beer. It takes time for it to settle. Yes? Uh, he implied You would not you would be killed by the angel. So I, I, but, but this book, 
we're going, we're just in chapter, we're just in chapter three. Next, next week, we're going to talk about the, the man of the Messiah. And I think Dr. Peters can help us understand that question, which is a very excellent question, because we're all the people who aren't Catholic, but are great Christians. So can they go to heaven? I mean, obviously the simple answer is yes. There's nowhere in the Catholic Church's teaching that says you have to be Catholic to go to heaven. There's nowhere. Zero places. Okay. Can I ask you a question? But, but why would it be so if he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you're going Maybe it's the kind of life. We'll get to that next week, probably. Outstanding. This is probably something you worry about. I did test, and I'm not, I don't have what you think I have. Um, <laughs> it just proves that not everything is that. I just have a sinus infection. Yeah. You know, I get a lot. I've had it my whole life since I was a young kid. Yes? <clears throat> question about the religion. There's so many things that wonderfully helped the Catholic Church to evolve. It was an evolving thing after the apostles. It didn't just form overnight. And the most fascinating story I've heard is the story of Constantine at the Barovian Bridge. And he saw that cross in the sky and, he, and God said, listen, by my cross you will be victorious. And Constantine won that battle. But it wasn't just the battle. Because of him, Catholicism and Christianity was allowed in the Roman Empire. There was no persecution. People were worshiping all the Greek mythologies. I mean, there was a big struggle between Christianity and Greek mythology. That had to bring us to all the gods. But after Constantine, it was very interesting because that Christianity really got, you know, some traction and it started getting some The empire allowed Christianity to be practiced. It was a very phenomenal epic time to be. Bill, Bill Gate Bridge. Constantine the Great has, has, a, has a vision. It's worth, it's the only place I grew up in Rome, by the way. I hate it. Thanks for pointing that out. Who else, though? <laughs> You're doing a great job of offering Catholic Church's theology of the priesthood. Our priesthood is not hereditary. Like somebody said, oh, you follow Sasaki? I have. Was your dad follow Sasaki? No, that's not how it The Levites were the priestly tribe. In order to be a priest in the time of Jesus, you had to be a Levite. The, the priesthood of Jesus Christ is prefigured by Melchizedek, who is not political, but he offered to, he offered the uh, unbloody sacrifice of bread and wine. And then Abraham offered him a tenth. So if you're not getting a tenth, I suggest you listen to that. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a theology of the Catholic priesthood. Priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Levites. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to point out that it says here at the bottom of verses two that we talk about That's why I call it. So, uh, the last question we'll let you go is to seek and overtake so much more. Father Farber, who's a convert from Baptist, said, If I weren't a Catholic, I'd have to be a Jew. Because it's the only religion made by God is Judaism and Catholicism. Uh, we don't ever demonstrate other Christians because we love them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily Thank you, Father. Let's pick up the sheets, please.